I'm Cody Robertson, the associate pastor here at Lindenwood, and it is good to be with you all this morning. We are turning to scripture, and I actually have two scriptures for you this morning, so as you turn in your Bibles or on your phones, you will do some flipping in the middle of it, but I invite you to stand as we read these scriptures and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 15 beginning in verse 9, and we will be reading through verse 12 this morning. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And then flip on over to 1 John, towards the end of the New Testament, chapter 4, verse 16. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. You may be seated. Just a couple weeks ago, it was Friday night, and I had one of those moments. I know many of you are obsessed with March Madness. I know I'm in a basketball town, but a couple weeks ago, my March Madness is on, which is the NCAA Wrestling Championships. (laughs) I grew up wrestling, and as I've kind of actually gotten further away from being able to do it physically, I've enjoyed watching it more. And obviously, I am a big guy, so I love watching the heavyweights. And not that you care, but it is prime time for heavyweight collegiate wrestling right now. So a couple Fridays ago were the semifinals. And there was this match. It went down to to the end of the match. It was double overtime, and there are these two ginormous 280 pound men just throwing themselves around like doing things 280 pound men can't do. I about jumped off the couch at one point in time. My wife just kind of rolled her eyes as she kept reading her book, not paying attention to me. And I was all fired up, but it was past my bedtime. And so I was in that weird between where I was excited, but I knew I needed to get to bed or else I was gonna be really tired the next morning. And so I grabbed my book and started reading as I did my things to prepare for bed. I took my allergy medicine, you know, all all of those things. I laid down, and I read about half a page in my book, and I had the moment. Oh, man, I forgot to brush my teeth. (laughs) Now, I know if you heard Jeff's sermon a couple weeks ago, you're worried about the dental hygiene of your ministers, but I take really good care of my teeth. I'm not like the ideal candidate for the dentist to hold me up, but I do a really good job of taking care of them. I have ever since my parents paid thousands of dollars for my teeth to look very nice when I was in high school. So I have always brushed my teeth twice a day in the morning, at night, without fail, even in the days when I came home in a not-so-sober state of mind, I would still brush my teeth. It was something I always did. But somehow, just a couple weeks ago, I got distracted between watching the wrestling, between reading my books, and I didn't brush my teeth. You ever have moments like that where you just randomly have a realization that you forgot something or you realized how distracted you were for things. Good for you. I have another moment as well that happened to me recently. I've been having trouble with my car and the lock on the driver's side door. 
randomly, it won't open. And so I'll hit the button, I'll hit the button, and all three other doors will come unlocked, but the driver's side door will stay locked. And so Jeff and I went out to lunch recently. I hit the button. My side wouldn't open, and so I said, Jeff, I know this is kind of like redneck of me, but will you reach over, flip the handle, and open the door for me? And Jeff's like, yeah, I did that for about two years in a car I used to have, so I get it. Well, later that day, I was carrying groceries because I had gone to the store, and I walked up. I hit the button again, and the door doesn't unlock. So I'm like, well, do I call Jeff and have him come over and go across and open it for me? But, but he wasn't there. That would have been very nice. So I'm like, maybe I should open the back door, and then I can just kind of reach around, right? Or maybe I should walk around the car. And it was about that moment when I looked down at my hand and realized I have a key that I can put into the lock and unlock the door. But I had been so distracted, so forgetful, that I missed such a basic, simple thing. We have all of these moments. I know you, I, you probably don't want to admit, admit it, but we have these, right? We put our keys in the door and then we leave them in the door. We lose our phone, so you have to go over to your computer and pull up the Find the iPhone app and beep it so you can find it around your house. I don't know about you, but I have the wallet, keys, phone, wallet, keys, phone before I leave the door. Why? Because I've forgotten things before. Recently, right, it was wallet, keys, phone, mask. I don't have to worry about that quite as much, but I still have it. You all ever have those? Raise your hand if you've ever had a moment like that. We are easily forgetful and distracted in life. It's just a part of human nature these days. So it's not really a surprise that a couple months ago we were having Bible study on Zoom. And one of the actual cool things of doing Bible study on Zoom is we can ask poll questions and get input from all of the people who are signed on. And so the poll question that night was, why don't you pray? What are the things that keep you from praying? And there's some really, really deep things on there like, I don't know if God is listening. I don't know what to say. I don't know if my prayer actually matters. Some really deep things, things that I've had conversations with people over the years in ministry often. And yet, far and away, the number one reason for why people don't end up praying in their life was because they got distracted and forgot. And if you were distracted with lots of other things happening on, going on in your life, it's really, really hard to live into what we read in our scripture today. In both of these passages, you could basically boil it down to live, love, Lord. Now, if one of you sees that at Hobby Lobby, when you go tomorrow, you can buy me that sign, and we will put it up in Jeff's house. But live, love, Lord. The gospel ties live, love, Lord to commandments. This command I give to you. In the gospel, we're reading in the middle of the Last Supper story where Jesus is teaching his disciples with the words he's going to leave them with before he is crucified. And he says this command, love one another. In the same teaching in these chapters, Jesus washes their feet and says, serve one another. Loving one another, serving one another, live into this love. In the letter in 1 John, we get an emphasis on the last things. This is how we know that when it is all said and done, we're going to be okay by living into this love. And what is that love? Both of these passages boil it down to this. God loves. God, central to God's character, central to who God is, is love. And this love has carried out into what God is doing in Jesus. God loves us. God is in Jesus showing us this love. God loves us first. Which I should note that if, if you hear anything 
in this sermon this morning, know that, that God loves you, that no matter what you got going on in your life, God is not here to punish you. God is not out to get you. God loves you. And God is inviting you to be in that love with God. The gospel says remain in that love. 1 John says live in that love, but they're really the same word in Greek. And one of the other translations, the New Revised, translates both of those abide. Abide in the love of the Lord. Abide is not a word that we use too much. Gen Xers, Big Lebowski doesn't count. <laughs> Abide in God. Thank you, Jeff, for laughing at that joke. <laughs> Abide, live, remain, dwell. Dwell. I know you've heard dwell in the house of the Lord, but these passages call us to dwell in the love of of the Lord. If you need an image for what this looked like, picture a fish swimming in the ocean, and you are the fish, and God's love is the ocean around you. Abide in it, exist in it, remain in it, live in it, be in it. And all of these distractions, even the simple little ones, are like a hook that we bite and pulls us out of the water. It seems so simple, it seems so little, but these distractions take us from the love of God. So you want a way to really abide in the love of God? You want a way to counter those distractions? It's simple, but really, really hard. Intentional prayer. I know that's a big preacher answer. I know that you probably already know that. But we have to be reminded, if I forget to brush my teeth randomly, even though I do it every single day, we need to be reminded as people and followers of God that prayer actually connects us back to the love of God. That prayer gets us in to where God is working the most. Any coffee drinkers in here? Who needs caffeine to get started in the day? See, here's the thing is, is that when you start drinking coffee, especially, maybe it happens with other things, I don't know, but when you drink too much and you've only been drinking coffee for a little bit, what happens to you? You start, you start to get the little, right? You get a little jittery. You get the shake, right? Anyone else? This happened to me. You get that shake, but then you keep drinking that much coffee every single day, and pretty soon, over time, it starts to lose its effect on you. And then pretty soon you're drinking too much coffee and all it means is that you're really tired laying in bed at night and can't sleep. But the jitter's gone because the more coffee you drink, the more it loses its effect on you. But prayer, prayer works the opposite. The more you pray, the deeper you go into the love of God. The more you pray, the more you get to experience God's presence in your life. I know we have some nerdy, sciencey people in this room. They can actually map this out in scans of your brain while you're praying. They can see your brain lighting up in all sorts of different areas from prayer, and they, they create a baseline with that, and they tell you, go home every single day, spend 30 minutes in prayer. And then about 30 days later, they invite people back, and map their brains again, and you know what? It lights up even more because they have been spending time in prayer. And we know that just because something might be lighting up in our brain, that, that doesn't mean it's just in our brain. We know that in that prayer, we are encountering something deeper happening. God is at work in our lives. You actually are changed through prayer. I can't explain it, I've gone to school for many years. I've been in ministry for a while now. I can't give you the explanation for how it works. I just know that it works. The more time you spend in prayer, the more you are changed, and the more you tap in to the love of God that John tells us about this morning. Prayer is like 
date night with God. I don't know if you, you have a special relationship with someone, but you have to work on it, right? So you go on dates. You set aside time. You take date night. And if you only get date night once every six months, it's good, it's nice, but it has less effect. If you have date night every single week, it begins to take on a little bit more power. And what's really fascinating is that when you have date night, it doesn't make date night special. It actually makes everything else you do throughout your time together special. Or maybe you have a relationship with friends. If you've ever had a time in your life where every week or every month you had that moment where you got to get together with friends and just jo enjoy each other's company, the more you did that, the deeper your friendship went. And it spilled over. So it wasn't just those moments when you were gathering together over a meal. It actually overflowed. So that when one of you was experiencing a crisis or a difficulty, you didn't have to wait for your friend to show up at your special time together. You could call them up because that relationship was already deep. We need to spend time with God. And the hard thing is, we have to take intentional time with God because we are forgetful and easily distracted. There are no guarantees to prayer. No guarantees. There's no magical moment where you just say the right words and, and you'll experience God's love. But I promise you, the more you do it, the more it will change what is happening in your life. Now, I know there are lots of apps out there. I know that there are audio Bibles. I know that there are devotionals that you can just play and listen to on your phone. If that works for you, wonderful. But I do have to say that we know our devices, our TVs, our computers, our phones, are part of our distraction problem. And there's a decent chance that the solution to our distraction problem is not tied to the things that are causing the distraction. Whatever tradition you grew up in, whether you were Catholic or charismatic, you have a tradition of prayer. These last several weeks, we have been talking about traditions that have been in the church for thousands of years. And we have a tradition of prayer that I encourage you to start. So I'm going to leave you with a challenge. For the next two weeks, the next two weeks, between now and Easter Sunday, I want you to pray the Lord's Prayer in the morning and in the evening. You're going to forget tomorrow. Show yourself some grace. And keep trying. Pray in the morning Pray in the evening. If you don't know it, we will pray it later in the service. Take a picture of the screen. Pray the Lord's Prayer. Now, I am not a morning person, and so I pray after my first sip of coffee. If you need to do that with the Lord's Prayer, it's a wonderful time. I'm going to tell you all what I've been doing in my life not as some standard that you should follow, but because it's seriously begun to change who I am and what I have going on in my life. I'm not a morning person, so I begin my prayers after my first sip of coffee. Uh, I have a young kid, so I wake up early, even though I don't like to, because it's the only time it's nice and quiet. And after I have that first sip of coffee, I open up my prayer book, and I have a coffee prayer in that prayer book, and it goes like this. Meet me, O Christ, in this stillness of morning. Move me, O Spirit, to quiet my heart. Mend me, O Father, from yesterday's harms. And then I take another drink of coffee. From the discords of yesterday, resurrect my peace. 
From the discouragements of yesterday, resurrect my hope. From the weariness of yesterday, resurrect my strength. From the doubts of yesterday, resurrect my faith. From the wounds of yesterday, resurrect my love. Let me enter this new day aware of my need and awake to your grace, O oh Lord. And I got to tell you all that waking up early in the morning, still needing my coffee to get going, nothing special has ever happened. But I found that as I did it every single morning, that things started happening in my life and God's love started showing up in unexpected places. For the past several weeks, actually for the, since the beginning of this calendar year, you might have noticed if you're on Facebook that we've been leading prayers at lunchtime, Monday through Friday. My day is Thursday. And every week, it's a little bit different, a little bit something to pray, pray for. And one week, I'll be honest with you, I didn't know what to pray that day. So on my table, in my, in my office, you can go on there, and, and I have, Jeff called it my sacramentals table. I have like a little prayer bowl. I have a cross. I have a communion kit, and I have a little labyrinth that's about this big, and it has a little stick with it. And, and if you don't know what a labyrinth is, it kind of looks like a maze, but there's only one path on the thing. And normally you walk them, but I just was sitting in my office, so I had this one, and I said, I'm, I'm just going to teach people to pray a labyrinth, and I'm going to do that live on Facebook. I don't know if anyone will care, but I, I guess that's just what I need to do right now. So I started walking through that labyrinth with my little stick, explaining what I was doing on Facebook, trying to teach you all that, that if you need another way to pray, here's a way to pray. And I followed that, and it kind of stilled my heart. And you get to the middle in that. And when you walk a labyrinth or follow it on a finger labyrinth, when you get to the middle, that, that's where you really talk to God. And I got to tell you all, right there on Facebook Live. I don't even know if you can tell it when you were watching, but I hit the middle on that labyrinth and whoosh, chills down my spine. I almost started crying right there on Facebook because God's love showed up in my life when I least expected it. I can't explain it. I don't know why it happened in that moment, but all I can think is that I had been taking time every day to tell God that I am listening, that I am present. And so God showed up to tell me that God saw that I was abiding in his love every day. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, in the midst of our distractions and our forgetfulness, will we find ways to spend time with you, to remain in your love, God, to live in your love, knowing that we are sinking into your grace. May it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.